we're going to start leaning into talking about uh, talking about relationships, like human relationships, one one with another. Um, if you if you recall, if you if you were there when we started our submission series, uh, we in in Ephesians chapter five, uh, there's that one critical verse that says submit one to another in in reverence to Christ. And, and so that's, that's kind of going to be a springboard for this next little bit um, as we talk about, as we talk about relationships. Um, and again, there's all different kinds of relationships, but relationships are relationships. Um, now, if you are, if you are seeking a romantic relationship, then, uh, then we'll talk about, we're going to talk about that too or you might already be in a romantic relationship. Um, but everything that we're gonna talk about applies to all of our, to all of our relationships. Um, but we're gonna look at some, we're gonna look at some, some distinct relationships, uh, family, friends, um, but all the same stuff applies to all of them. But we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about it tonight we're going to be in the book of Genesis, Genesis 27. Um, so yeah, come, go with me to Genesis chapter 27. I'm gonna, gonna read a little bit, cause this is, there's a story and I just wanna draw some things out of the story. Uh, so there's lots of different types of, of relationships that we engage in in life. And the foundational relationship for all of us is family. Uh, and actually I, I highly recommend uh, that you that you go on YouTube over to Golden Gate Missionary Baptist Church. That is our parent church, my my home church in Dallas. Uh, that you go there and and take a look at the the sermon series Pastor Parker is in. Uh, he's been talking about it all year about family all year. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna get into a little bit of that. But he's he is my elder and and my discipler and and a lot of things. So you want to get some teaching from him. This relationship dynamic that we're going to look at in Genesis chapter 27 is, is the family unit of origin. Now, we all come from, from very different, uh, we come from different backgrounds. Some people came up in a two-parent home. Um, those parents may have been married. Maybe they weren't. Uh, maybe they were the same gender. Maybe they were not. Maybe you were raised in a single parent home, and, but you had both your parents in your life, or maybe you only had one parent in your life. Uh, maybe the parents who you, who you grew up with, uh, maybe were not biologically your parents, but they were still your parents. Um, maybe you had siblings, maybe you didn't have siblings. Um, it, like it, 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 runs, it runs the gambit. You may, you may have spent some time in, in, foster, in foster care. So you've had you've had different sets of parents throughout uh, throughout your upbringing. The family that we're looking at in this in this story tonight is, as far as we know, it's a family of four. It's mom and dad and two boys. Um, but the reason we're the reason I want to start here, as we journey talking about relationships, whether it's a series or not, is because. Well, this is where we all start. We all start in a family unit of origin. Um, in fact, that's what I just decided. That's what the title of tonight's study is, uh, Family Unit of Origin. And just in case you're wondering, yes, all family units of origin are dysfunctional. If you happen to believe that your family unit of origin does not possess any dysfunctional characteristics. Might I call your attention to the mirror? Because, well, your family is dysfunctional. I just want to say that my family is dysfunctional. My family unit of origin is dysfunctional, but everybody's is. So I'm not ragging on my family, and I'm not talking bad about yours. We're just talking about what. We're just talking about facts. So Genesis chapter 27, um, I'm in the ESV tonight, and I'm going to read, um, I, I kind of want to read the whole story, but I'm only going to go 
up to, I'll stop when I stop. So just go along with me. If you don't have uh, a physical Bible, please let us know so we can send a physical Bible to your residence or your job if you don't get mail at your house. Um, or you can just use you can just use your digital Bible. It's all the same. Genesis chapter 27. I'm going to start at verse one. Uh, well, let me give you just a tiny bit of background so you know who the characters are. There's Isaac. Isaac is the guy who, when he was younger, uh, before he had a family of his own, um, his dad tried. His dad was going to kill him. Um, wonderful, wonderful history. Uh, his dad was going to kill him on an altar, and he was. And his dad was doing it for God. He was. He was going to sacrifice him. He was ready to do that. Um, but we don't talk enough about how 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 Isaac might have experienced that. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. But we've got Isaac. We've got his wife Rebecca, who's also his cousin. We're not going to get into that either. Uh, and their two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau are twins. Um, and the way, the way things worked then and still kind of now when there are more than one, when there's more than one child in the family unit of origin, the firstborn gets the birthright. Well, they're twins. So how do you decide that? Well, whoever comes out first and, and they, Jacob and Esau, even in the womb, it is said, um, at least in my translation of the Bible, that they liked to tussle uh, in the womb. And Rebecca, their mother, was like, Lord, why are they tussling in my womb? Um, God explains it. So these are our four main characters. Isaac, whose daddy almost killed him. Uh, Rebecca, who uh, at one point, Isaac pretended that she was not his wife for his own safety, just like his father did things get passed down. Uh, then we have Jacob and we have Esau. Esau was the firstborn. He was the one who came out first. And uh, one, of the, one of the meanings for Jacob's name is heel grabber uh, or trickster. And when, when Esau came out first, Isaac had grip as a baby and was holding on to his brother's foot, like trying to pull him back and, and come out. Probably wasn't exactly like that, but he got his name because he was holding his brother's foot. Where we come in, where we enter the story is, is Jacob, spoiler alert, Jacob is going to get the blessing that belongs to the firstborn. Uh, but here's how it goes down. Genesis chapter 27, starting at verse one, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening to Isaac, or was listening when Isaac spoke to his son, Esau, so when Esau went to the field to hunt, hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, I heard your father speaking to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from, from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. He didn't have no, he wasn't hairy, he was smooth. His beard probably didn't connect. I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. 
Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats, excuse me, and the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. We'll come back to that. And she put delicious food she put the delicious food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son, Jacob. So he went into his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord, your God, granted me success. That's where we're going to stop. That's Genesis uh, 27, verses 1 through 20. The word of the Lord is already blessed. Father God, uh, your word is blessed. Now bless us that we might, that we might get our lives together um, by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So family, family unit of origin. If you, if you heard, this is a very dysfunctional family, extremely dysfunctional. And everything before it is dysfunctional, everything after it also dysfunctional. But, but Genesis 27 is like, it highlights like this is, this, this is the summit of dysfunction mountain. Um, there, there's trickery going on here, but, and, and we'll get to it, whose, whose fault it is and all of that good stuff. But let's just, let's just look at a few things that are interesting that may or may not have shown up in your family unit of origin uh, or, uh, or may or may not exist in the family unit of origin that you are creating or desire to, desire to, to have at, at, at some point in time. Uh, so going back to the beginning, I, I want to point out in, in verse 1, Jake, or excuse me, Isaac said, Isaac said to Esau, my son, he said, my son, and Esau answered him. And then let's, let's, let's jump down real quick to, to verse five. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son, Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. There is a lot of disownership <laughs> in this family. And I know none of us who have siblings have ever, or who have siblings have ever said uh, to the other sibling, um, come get your father, your, your dad. Your dad is wildin'. Um, but Isaac has his son and Rebecca has her son. Now, it, it says this earlier in Genesis that they had favorites. Those were their favorites. Isaac uh, had chosen Esau as his favorite, and he poured into him and didn't do nothing with Jacob. And, and Rebecca poured into Jacob. So there are, some, there are some odds that Isaac and Rebecca are at that the kids don't know anything about. Like, kids just come into the world, Right. We just, came, none of us asked to be here. We just came here in, in whatever situation, condition the world was in when we got here. Whatever it is, these two parents, Isaac and Rebecca have, have made favorites of their sons. And, and it, it comes out clear as day in verses five and six. And, and we'll, we'll get to questions later, but, but I wonder what type of impact that has. What type of impact does it have for one child to be favored by the father and, and not the mother or vice versa? What's missing? Now, let some people tell you, it's, we, we, don't need, we don't need traditional families. And when I say traditional, don't hear something I'm not saying, but the, there are people who, who would say that you know, children don't need a mother and a father. That's how we all get here. But some would say, 
moms don't do nothing. Moms aren't really needed. Some would say dads, men don't do nothing anyway. So, uh, so we're just fine. Um, but then, but then we have, you know, we, we see the impacts of, of fatherlessness on, on both boys and girls, men and women. Um, we don't have to go into that. The evidence is clear. And, and when mothers neglect one or all of their children, the evidence is clear on that. Uh, and we got therapists and psychologists who are part of our community who could tell you all about that stuff. But like Re Rebecca is listening to her husband and rather than supporting him and what he's doing, she undermines him. I don't know if you've ever, if you, if you grew up in a household with two parents, I don't know if you've ever seen one parent undermine the other, but it's, it's messy, isn't it? Or maybe it probably didn't happen in your house, but maybe you went to a, a, a friend's house or a cousin's house and you saw they, mommy or daddy, uh, undermine, undercut the other. It's just really messy and you don't know what to do. Like the, the kids, kids don't know, kids don't know what to do with that. So we see some we see some dysfunction again. This is we're looking at the family unit of origin and everything, all of the relationships that Jacob and Esau are going to have in life, all spring forth from from these foundational relationships: mother, father, brother, and brother. It's it's wild. So Rebecca's listening to Isaac, and then she goes to her son and says, hey, I heard your dad, and he's about to bless your brother Esau. So go do this and like do what I say and come right back. Now, both children did what their parent said to do. Esau went out and he went to go hunt, and, and Jacob did what his, what his mother said to do. R remember that from, from Ephesians? Uh, not that Ephesians existed when, when all of this happened, but, but children, obey your parents in the Lord, honor your father and mother. It's, it's part of that, that cycle of, of submission. So these kids, are, like kids do what their parents tell them to do for the most part. And that's what, and that's what, and that's what they did. Let's go to, let's go, let's go to verse. Let's jump very quickly to verse, uh, uh, verse 11. All right, so so the first thing we saw in verses five and six, we see we see separation, we see a lack of ownership, a lack of um, ownership's not the right word, uh, but a lack of responsibility for one another. Like his son, my son, your brother. She didn't even say my other son, your brother. So every so we see disconnectedness first and foremost. And, and then verse 11, but Jacob said to his mother, he said to, said to Rebecca, his mother, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a smooth man. Now let's, uh, I got to back up. So sorry. Verse nine, go to, go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare a delicious meal, uh, delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you should, you shall bring it to your father to eat so he can bless you before he dies. We have disconnectedness, and now we have deceit. Help me deceive your father. Help me deceive your father, and you'll get the benefit. I just want to tell you that when somebody, like that's the equivalent of, A, don't look in this brown baggie, but I need you to run this bag down to the corner, such and such and such and such. And you're going to see a man, he's going to be sitting on the stoop. And when you get to just give him this, he's going to give you something. Just, I, I just need you to make this drop and you get to, and I'll, and I'll take care of you. Like, it's going to be good for you. whatever you get, you can keep. Yeah. There's a good, there's a really good chance that you're going to jail. Don't take that proposition. But Jacob, Jacob takes this proposition. He takes this proposition to, to deceive his father and steal his brother's blessing. That's what his mom said. And here, here's, here's how, like, let's, let's track with, with the, the frame of mind that's going on with everybody here. Here's what Jacob's response is in verse 11. 
Jacob said to Rebecca, his mother, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth, hairless man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. Jacob was not worried about whether or not this was right or wrong. Because there was already disconnectedness in, in the world of dysfunction that they lived in, because there was already disconnectedness, it, Jacob, it, it seems as though, based on his response, Jacob was okay to deceive and to steal. His only concern was getting caught. Now, in our day-to-day -day lives, how, how much of the things that we do in the way that we relate to other people, can, can we see how, how it stems from how we related in, in our nuclear family, our family unit of origin, good or bad? But how many of us see that, that uh, sometimes we're only worried about the consequences for ourselves, not the consequences for the family, not how will this affect the family if I do this thing, I, especially, especially us. I'm an older millennial, and ever since older millennials came into existence and everybody after, we have been getting progressively and progressively more individualistic and, and buying into the uh, the, the great deception that is the American dream, which is I, I, me, all by myself, do it on my own. No, nope, I don't need to live in, I've, I don't need to live in a home with other people and share resources and, and, and split expenses. No, nope, I need to go out all by myself and get all of my own bills for myself because for the last 18 to 20 years, this hasn't really been working out. The free food, the, you know, bills being paid and just having to contribute some things around the house. That doesn't work for me. I need to go out on my own and accumulate my own debt. Me, it's me. It's me. I did it. I did that. But he's only, Jacob is only worried about what happens to himself. What happens to him? His concern is not, well, what about Esau? Like Esau, Esau's out there hunting. What's going to happen when Esau gets back? And after hunting, he's going to be tired. And then like, he's, he's not worried about that. He's not worried about, he knows his, it said in verse one that Isaac's eyes were dim. It means his eyesight was getting bad. He, whatever, whatever he had, he couldn't see real well. And so uh, fooling him by sight was the easy part. Jacob wasn't worried about that. He was only worried about like, what if he touches me? I, I, I could probably get away with everything else, but what if he touches me? How is that going to impact me? I won't get a blessing, I'll get a curse. Then his mom sells him some, sells, this is a, this is a send off right here. Verse 13, his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. Now listen, we're, uh, most of us are, are, are adults here, and if we if we still live under the under the tutelage of our parents, um, it's important that we know God for ourselves, and that we uh, that we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, that we uh, that we can get insight and discernment and wisdom from God directly. Because sometimes it be your own people. It, it, for some people, sometimes it be your own parent. And in this case, it what she said, don't worry. The curse won't be on you, it'll be on me. Now, first of all, how, Rebecca, how, mother, is this possible that if I actively go and deceive my father and he figures out that it's me deceiving him, how is the curse gonna be on you? He didn't question that. He just he just went and did it. Mind you, Jacob and Esau, like these, they're not little kids. They, like they're grown, but they stayed with their, they didn't go out and get apartments and, and buy a car with a $400 payment. They didn't go do all that. Well, they didn't have cars. They didn't go out and buy a donkey with a $400 uh, payment. They stayed, they stayed at the, at the crib until it was time to get married. And then they just 
put up a tent nearby. But she she says to him, the curse is gonna the curse is gonna be on me. Just go do just do what I say. He's grown enough to know better, and and I think all of us, I think all of us are are old enough to know better if we're being told to do something by uh, someone who is in authority, who has relationship with us to the point where we will just do whatever they say. That sometimes the things that, that we do uh, just because we're told to do it aren't always in our best interest. Now, as children, we, we gotta go with it and God, all that, God places all that on, on our parents. But there comes a time and Jacob is about the age. He's a big enough age. And he should be like, ah, mama, I don't see how that's gonna work. Cause he's like, I'm gonna be right there. And he's gonna, if he touches me, I'm gonna be in his hands. And daddy got strong hands. I don't know. I, I don't think I'll be able to get away. And I don't see how the curse gonna fall on you because I'm responsible for my actions. I'm responsible for what I do. But no, because of this in enmeshment that they've got going on, look it up, it's a fun word, because of this enmeshed relationship, um, dare, dare I say, I won't say it, enmeshed is good enough. Verse 14, so he went and, and took them, he did what his mama said, and his mama prepared some food, just, just like his daddy loves. The trickery, sometimes, sometimes family, will use what they know about you. My goodness. I know somebody just, somebody already, some, one of y'all could finish that sentence. They will use what they know about you. They will use your likes. They will use the things that you are good at against you for their own benefit. Oh, I'm gonna make the kind of food your father likes. Clearly, Rebecca ain't, th ain't worried about Isaac or his well-being or, or his satisfaction in life. And who knows? Uh, you know, we only know a little bit of, 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 about their relationship, but it's clear she don't really care for him. She don't like Isaac like that. I know just what he likes. I'm going to prepare that. And you, you go take it to him. Then... Rebecca, verse 15, then she, then she goes and she takes the best garments, F further, further pitting these two boys against one another. Jacob and Esau are twins, like they're supposed to be thick as thieves, but only one of them is a thief. And they're already pit against one another because mom and dad have a favorite. And then here we, we, we read... Uh, we read that that Rebecca further pits Jacob against Esau, saying, "Hey, you could get that blessing. You you could get that blessing. Hey, don't worry about your brother. Your brother's gone. Let me help you take from your brother." Further pitting them against one another, but then she takes it a step further. Now, let me say something real quick because. We're talking about Rebecca and don't want it to seem like we're just going in, like it's all the mother's fault. No, Isaac chose a favorite first and Isaac neglected Jacob. Isaac ignored Jacob. Isaac did not pour into Jacob, which contributed to the ease with which Jacob was like, bet, I'll, I'll do it. But what if I get caught? What if he finds out? So Isaac is not in the clear here. Isaac, he is, he's in the home, but he is an absentee father to Jacob. So what we see here is, is what Rebecca is doing. And she further, she further pits these two boys against one another, not boys, they're men by now, but verse 15, then Rebecca took the best garments of Esau, her older son. She went and got his best clothes. Have you, if you're a sibling, if you're a sibling, especially if you're, if one of your siblings is uh is of you know same same make and model as you, um, and they just go and, and take your clothes. Like my sister didn't take my clothes, but you know who takes my clothes, and I and I love her with all my heart. My wife takes my clothes, and 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 I, like I used to get mad about it, but now I just compliment her on her new shirt. Like oh that's a nice shirt. Where did you get that? That's nice. Oh I 
have a hoodie just like that one. Crazy. Mind you, I always, I, I always buy two hoodies. Always buy two hoodies. I don't care if, if, if most of social media thinks that I am a foolish mortal. I'm, I'm going to stay buying two hoodies. And she's still going to wear mine when hers is dirty. But, but, but like, we don't like folks. Don't take my clothes. Like, ask first. And here is this man's mother going in his closet, taking his best clothes and putting them on his brother to help him steal his blessing. And this may be a question later. I don't know. It might not be because everybody doesn't have a sibling. But but is it possible that, that, that some of the, the angst or animosity that exists between you and one of your one of your relative peers, whether it's a sibling or cousin, is it possible that that was planted there by other people? Like other y'all were just fine getting along when y'all was seven, eight, nine, and ten. But when soon soon as you got like solid into the double digits, things started to change. And, and you really can't, you really can't pinpoint why. Sometimes folks will use stuff they know about you to mess things up. So we, we what did we have? What did I, what did I say? We had, we had the disconnection. There was, there was disconnect in the family versus five and six. Then we saw a deceit where, where Rebecca, Rebecca is like, okay, we're going to deceive. And, and now, now dissension is being stirred because it's, going, it's getting deeper. Not just going to take his blessings. We're going to take his, we're going to take his clothes too. She put them on her younger son, Jacob. Now, the reason she did this is because they didn't have Febreze back then. And so Esau's clothes were gonna smell like Esau, like the outdoor, like the great outdoors. Jacob stayed in the house. Jacob probably smelled like, like lentils and, and pork chops. Uh, so she put some other clothes on him. She put some other clothes on him so that he would smell like his brother. And then from the goats, she takes this hair. She takes the skin of the goats and puts, and puts it on. Now, listen. That's in verse 16. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck, otherwise known as the kitchen. Even his kitchen was, was, was bare. And she put goat skin on him. This is, there's nothing like spiritual about this, but how hairy was Esau? Goat skin, goat hair? But this is all part of the dissension, like stirring dissension among people. Like she's pitting people against one another and, and she's not going to be involved. She said that she said the curse, the curse will be on me. You just go do what I say. But she's not going to be involved. Jacob's the one wearing Esau's clothes. Jacob's the one with the skin on, his, on the back of his neck. Jacob is the one carrying the food into his father. Verse 18, so he went to his father, Jacob went to his father, my father, he said, here I am, or my, he said, my father, so he starts off, this is carrying on the, the deceit, my father, you know how when you're trying to pretend, if you're ever trying to pretend to be somebody else, you answer somebody's phone for them, you say as few words as possible hoping that you, they don't get you into a conversation uh, and start saying words that you say differently than, than the person you pretending to be. And Isaac says to him, here I am, who are you, my son? Isaac knows something ain't quite right. Who are, who are you? It doesn't, it, it doesn't, the math is already not math. Isaac can't see too well, but he can, he can still hear. And he can still tell time. He can still count to himself because he asks him, how'd you, how'd you get back so fast? But here I want to, before verse 19, and this is important. This is, this is the critical moment for, for us, for those of us who are grown. And, and, and if you're not grown up yet, this critical moment is coming where, where it's time to take all the, we want to take all of the good, all of the wonderful things. Parents do the best that they know how to do. Uh, 
with what they got, most of them. And so there comes this moment where we have to make a choice. We have to decide what belongs to us and what stays behind. What belongs to us and what stays behind. And so right here is the decision. This is the decision. Here's the decision that Jacob makes. Verse 19, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. Bless me, bless me. Bless me now indeed. The lie did not become Jacob's until he told it. This was all his mother's deceit. Even standing there with his brother's clothes on, with, with, the, with the slimy goat skin and the hair on his arms, holding the food that his father loves. At this point, he's kind of like, like David when, when Saul, before he went to fight Goliath and, and Saul put his armor on him. It, it, there's this moment where David was like, nah, this doesn't fit me. This ain't it. Mm -mm. I got to go with what I know. But Jacob is like, uh, am I going to do this? My father? Who is it? Uh, all right, double down. I'm Esau. It's me. I'm your son. I did what you said. And that's, that's how you know when somebody's lying, too. When they, give you, when they give you too much information, of course, if it was Esau, he did what he said. It's me, your son, Esau. I have done what you have said. Now, please eat that your soul may bless me. It, when, you, when, when somebody's telling the truth, when they're not being deceitful, when they hadn't made a decision to, to take on lies for themselves, they don't say all that extra, but he said a whole bunch of extra. But Isaac said to his son, how is it? He, Isaac still is like, something's not right, but how is it? it like, I can't see, but my hearing, my hearing it still works. So who, who, who are you? And now he says, okay, I can't see, but I can still tell time. How is it that you have found that you found it so quickly, my son? And he answered. Now, this is the, I haven't thought of a D word for this. This is dumb. Here's what Jacob says in response to his father questioning yet again, because he knows something ain't quite right. And at some point, all of us have done this, or we will be tempted to do this. And that is bring God into our dysfunction, making God an accomplice. What did he say? Because the Lord your God granted me success. How many of us, I want to save this question, but I'm asking anyway, how many of us put off on God some of our worst attributes. That's just the way I am. Take it up with God. He's the one who made me this way. I'm a Libra. I can't help it. It's not my fault. God did this. God is the bringing God into the it's It's bad enough. It's bad enough that he went along with the deceit, that, that he had such an enmeshed relationship with his mother that he did something he knew was not right. And, it, it, and then he, here he goes wearing his brother's clothes and, and got this costume on with some goat skin and, and carrying this food that his mother made to just bold face lie to his dad's face. And he doubles down and says, I am somebody who I am absolutely not. And I've done something I absolutely did not do, just as you said to somebody else who was not me. But here I am. Bless me. And then he's, and then he doubles down. Well, God helped. God, God helped me. I want to, I want to caution all of us, starting with myself. Not all success, not all success comes from God. The success that Jacob had up to this point in this story that we have read was all at the hands of his mother, who was manipulating him to 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 harm her husband his father 
I don't hear no kind of I don't hear no kind of godly submission taking place in this in this family unit. But one other thing that I want to point out, and that is dismissal. I hope somebody wrote down all of these D words. Dismissal. See, twice, twice, Isaac was not so sure. In verse 18, he says, here I am. Who are you, my son? Not quite sure, but can't see, but my hearing still works. And I'm waiting for Esau, but I hear a different voice. And he gets, he gets a little line, he gets a line. And he, so he, he keeps going, but then he's like, but I can't see too well, but I've been counting. And how do you do that so fast? God help me. And then Isaac dismisses what he knows isn't right. And some of us have experienced things in our lives growing up that now has that now has great impact and influence on how we operate in relationships today when there was someone who knew better was in a position to do better and just and let it slide dismissed what they sensed wasn't right Uh, it don't seem right, but okay, I'm hungry. Which, by the way, a couple chapters ahead or back, not only is Jacob stealing Esau's blessing, he had already, he had already, he didn't steal his birthright. He, Esau sold him his birthright for some food. He'd been out working all day and Jacob was at the house uh, being, being a homemaker and, and he made some good food and his brother's like, oh, I'm so hungry. Uh, let me get some of your soup. He's like, give me your birthright. <laughs> okay. Esau was so hungry that he, he gave up his birthright. That was a, that's his bad. We like to say Jacob tricked him. Jacob didn't trick him on that one. Esau was just so hungry that he went, he, I want the food. And now we see Isaac, his father, the one who, who favored him, the, the parent who favored Esau, who was so hungry that he, he gave up his birthright. Now we see this father dismissing what he knows ain't quite right so he could eat. I wonder what Esau, where Esau got that from. Oh yeah, we're gonna talk about relationships. We're gonna talk about relationships. And, and the, the only place in, in here where, where God comes up, this isn't a sermon, this is Bible study, so I don't have to like take it to the cross. The only place where God comes up is when Jacob lies and puts his bad behavior on God, like, oh, God help me with what you see here, all a lie. But this is here for us to learn from. This is here for us to see what dysfunction looks like. This is just one version of dysfunction. The Bible is full of dysfunction. When people try to say like, oh, there's no, there, there's no examples of godly men in the Bible. They're, they're trash, like everybody's trash in the Bible. The Bible's about God, it's not about the people. The people are absolutely on some, on some garbage behavior, absolutely but we can learn from it rather than repeating it unnecessarily. We can, we can, yeah, we can, it's so easy to see when it's somebody else's family. I think that's why God left the story in here. So easy to see when it's somebody else's family. How do these things, how, how do you imagine these things would impact the relationships that Jacob and Esau would later have. And I'm gonna just tell you this one thing because we're not gonna, I'm not gonna walk us all through the, the life of Jacob. 
after Jacob leaves because because his brother is chasing him and wants to kill him because he stole his he stole his uh, his blessing. He goes and his mom tells him, "You go and you stay with you stay with your uncle. Stay with your uncle Laban." He goes out and he finds where his uncle is. Apparently, they've never they never met. Laban is Rebecca's brother. That's why it's Jacob's uncle. And Jacob tells Laban the story, everything that happened. And Laban's response is, oh yeah, we definitely family. Oh, we're definitely family. I know that you are my nephew based on the story you just told me. That's Rebecca for you. He didn't use all those words, but he literally said, oh, undoubtedly we are family. After he heard a story of major dysfunction. And then Jacob married his daughters. You think the dysfunction stopped?